The following program has been pre recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. Good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker with A Pause for Thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio. And we're glad to be here tonight. Uh, Lang Baker is with me again. Good evening, Lang. Howdy, Wayne. As usual, he's my heavy. Um, but yes, with this is a live call-in show, so feel free, t- and you are encouraged to call in, 343-9927, 343-9927, to share your thoughts and insights on the topic of the evening. And tonight's topic, Lang, in case you weren't aware... Um, yeah, inform me. Yes, right. Is um, well, Islam basically the um, things people believe about the Quran primarily, and about Islam in general. And to be fair to those who may have heard and been bothered by my promo, uh, I was a bit of an obnoxious person with it. But that's you know how you get people to listen to you um, sometimes. Um, I said the ridiculous things. We would talk tonight about the ridiculous things that many people believe about Islam, and that is obviously a subjective thing. But anyway, um, there's a lot to talk about because there's a lot that's being said about Islam and the Quran and other aspects of the Islamic faith that is just plain wrong, um, outrageously so. And that was one thing I found in doing the research for this show. Um, I found a lot of sites that really beat the drum and took things out of context and everything to try to show how evil Islam is and how, you know, they're they're terrible. They're based the whole whole religion's based in violence, blah blah blah, that kind of thing. I was really shocked to see, you know, how many sites out there are just lying. But let's start um one of the biggest things I recall, Lang, is the people screaming about um jihadists coming to the United States and wanting to force Sharia law on us. Um, you did some checking on what exactly Sharia law is, didn't you? I did some self-education about Sharia law okay. and exactly what it is. I'm not sure that anyone can say exactly because there's a lot of different uh, interpretations and understandings across time and across geography in different countries. Sharia is different. Uh, Basically, in common is the notion that Sharia law is is based on uh, the Quran first. Yeah, there's four levels or four priorities or four four components of okay. what it, what it's based on, uh, and the Quran is is at the top. But then we could get into just what the Quran is. Yeah, that as we, well, we only have but, half an hour, so. <laughs> Then, then the second is considered is the Hadith, which are the sayings of Muhammad, or more specifically the Sunnah, which are what have been determined to be the authentic sayings of Muhammad. Okay, and the had- Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, right? Right. And that's that Those stuff. Those are the sayings of Muhammad. Right, outside of, is, out, outside of what it, uh, the Quran, right, which he the, revealed. Okay. Yeah, the Quran uh, is supposed to be uh, what... God revealed to Muhammad over the course of 23 right. years. 23 years, okay. And there's some dispute as to whether the Quran refers to a text that preexisted in his... <laughs> Told you we're not going to do that. We're not going that far. Go ahead. So, okay. okay. I just wanted to clarify what hadith are, and, and it's, it's, well, it's Muhammad's... Well, hadith are the sayings, okay. but then the sunnah, the S-U-N-N-A-H, those are the authentic hadith, and there's controversy or differences of opinion in different schools and in different countries at different times in history as to which sayings are authentic. And in fact, uh, as recently as 2008, there was in Turkey uh, a, an investigation instigated to go through all the hadith and determine anew uh, which ones are authentic. So it's not like this was something decided centuries ago as to which are authentic and, and not. That was something we talked about um, before the show, and I want to get back to the four components, you know, Mm -hmm. so don't let me forget. But um, there seems to be a practice in the religion to, um, well, even in the Quran, really, there's later books seem to um, contradict or 
you know, a little bit or modify some of the earlier ones? Well, I'm not an expert by any means. Oh, me neither, but from Jason. from what I read, it's, it's not that the Quran is a chronological sequence. And so the experts go in, the, those who are expert in Arabic of that era can look and determine through studying these which are more, which came later in that 23 year period and which came earlier in that 23 period. It's not necessarily that because it's later in the Quran, it was also later in the 23 year period of, of, the, of Muhammad receiving this revelation. And sometimes there's, a, according to some of the Islamic scholars, there's a conflict in the more recent one is considered to have abrogated the conflicting earlier one. In other, other Islamic scholars, there's, there's no uh, abrogation that occurs at all. And so right. Both valid. Well, I remember, you know, like we were talking before the show, too, um, since it took 23 years for Muhammad to, you know, speak the entire word of God, the, the origins, the reason why God, and this is what I got from Houston Smith's The World Religions, The World's Religions, he said that um, God or Allah looked down and saw the terrible way the people in that part of the world were behaving. Um, they were having sex with just about anything that moved. There was a lot of uh, theft, a lot of murder and everything. And... He put down his law through the Prophet Muhammad to stop all that and create a set of sensible rules that would allow a society to prosper. And boy, did they, you know. But So I'm wondering if over the period of 23 years, as different communities and societies in the region um, began to adopt the Muslim faith and the Islamic law, or Sharia, that... Um, they found they fine-tuned or god fine-tuned so to speak or you know and i don't mean i just i don't want to sound blasphemous but you know things were kind of adjusted because things were changing and a new order was revealing itself and and needed some adjustment or whatever that was what i read as a description of why some of the scholars say that the more recent communications are abrogated the earlier ones because of the change in the community and, and they were to address that okay that change that just community. seems like a nod toward reality really even though we're talking about the divine word of god but uh, in the you know islam in muslim faith anyway okay so but that's so the going on to what the third and the fourth of the sources of sharia law uh, another one is is ijma I'm, I'm not I'm probably mispronouncing this terribly. It's I J M A, which are, is juridical consensus, consensus among the the judicial uh, experts in interpreting it. And what's considered consensus varies through the centuries and from country to country uh, as to who's an author authoritarian judicial juridical source and to what's what's a consensus. Uh, and then the fourth is is uh, generally. Generally, uh, analogical reasoning, which is K I Y A S, K I Y A S. Spelling it doesn't make it any but easier. Anyway, but, yeah. analogical reasoning. An example given was forbidding wine by analogy would forbid all intoxicants because right. it's their same, has the same Im impact. And yet, that's the fourth for many uh, of the. Uh, interpreters of Sharia, but according to uh, this one source, in one group, the, the Twelve are Shia, they reject the analo analogical reasoning and instead rely on the straight Reason. rational reasoning, right. inductive reasoning. Yeah. Okay, and like I mentioned in, you know, before the show, it, it seems to me that it's rational thinking to look at a prohibition on the consumption of alcohol and saying well that applies to all intoxicants to me that just makes you know reasonable sense you know but maybe i'm confused you know it's i wouldn't i wouldn't, wouldn't be the first time to get into the, the, the fine distinctions that the islamist oh, scholar, yeah. scholars draw between analogical reasoning and this other kind of reasoning yeah of course but, yeah that's just my understanding that, and yeah, I, yeah. That, is, that was pointed out as a distinction. So even in trying to state what the bases are for Sharia law, 
there's this great diversity. Right, but generally there are four, there's a hierarchy of four uh, components. The Quran's the number one source, mm -hmm. the Hadith, which is the sayings of, that Allah, not Allah, excuse me, um, the sayings of Muhammad. Muhammad said outside of the Quran, and then um, the other ones. Uh, right. Consensus and. Yeah, the consensus of of the juridical, the judicial, the judicial uh, authorities, and then rational thought or an, analogical okay. reasoning. You know, and one of the other to move on. Oh, by the way, uh, let me remind the listeners: you're listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on a pause for thought. Uh, we're talking about different things that people believe about Islam, the, the religion of Islam. Um, Call in and share your thoughts, 343-9927, 343-9927. We'd like to know what you can add to the discussion or maybe even correct or expand upon. Um, I'll fix and move on, Lang, but you, you have something there you want to put out? I was out? just going to say also in applying Sharia law, they, uh, they recognize or categorize human action into five different categories. Good, yes. The mandatory, the recommended, the neutral, the abhorred, and the prohibited. And it's only the two extremes here, the mandatory and the prohibited, that are the basis of either sin or crime. Okay, so, so failure failure to do the... Failure the, to do the recommended or indulging in the abhorred, those aren't punishable by the courts and aren't recognized as sin or a crime, but they are, they do form a basis in which uh, your rewards in the afterlife are determined. So okay, it, it's a grading, a gra where you, gradation of it offenses. Impacts on, it impacts on the consequences in the afterlife rather than consequences before the court in this life. Yeah, you, you won't get, um, this is, if, you, if you don't fulfill all of the uh, recommended things or if you indulge in some of the abhorrences, um, you'll only get, I guess, 30, 30 versions in the afterlife instead of 72, right? I wouldn't know the answer to that. <laughs> well, but okay, but the, the, the other <laughs> oh, what was the top one? The top one was required or mandatory. Mandatory, yeah. right? And if you don't do any of those or fail to do any of those, that diminishes your reward in heaven, is what you're saying. And no, the the mandatory can be a sin or a crime. Right. You're, okay, that's right. You're toast if you do that. And doing something that's prohibited also would be a sin right. or a crime. Okay. Now, and I made that joke about the 72 versions, and so I think I'll address that. Go right ahead. Because I was, I've always been bothered by that, but I, I thought, you know, it just didn't sound right when I'd hear people say that, you know, these jihadists are coming over here and, and they're perfectly happy to kill innocent people because they get to heaven and get all these, you know, 72 virgins or whatever. And that just didn't sound right. And finally, I, you know, for the show, I got in there and I thought, well, I want to check that one out. And lo and behold, um, everywhere that I saw reference to this in the Quran. Okay, now one thing, what they say is the martyrs, you know, people claim that martyrs, and they, they use the word martyr as um, someone who dies fighting for a cause. And But uh, from what I've come across, what I've learned, you know, in going through all this is that the older uh, definition of the word martyr, in at least Arabic, um, was um, a believer or um, you know it was a neutral thing somebody who was striving for you know God's cause or whatever and as a matter of fact jihad is not necessarily a violent thing jihad is a struggle and the way I saw it originally talked about in the Quran and the articles you know about it is that it's the struggle it's one's personal struggle through life to live in accordance with Allah's laws so, um, you know, the jihad there is, a, is misunderstood, and martyr also is misunderstood, because it's just martyr, as originally intended, um, did not involve killing or dying for anybody, um, you know, or blowing yourself up or whatever. Um, it simply meant the people that, you know, were following the law of God or, or standing up for it. Anyway, um, chapter 78, 31 through 35 of the Quran reads as follows. Um, for those who were aware of God, there is supreme fulfillment. Gardens, vineyards, maidens of matching age, and an overflowing cup. There they hear, they will hear no vain or lying talk. And this is from my Oxford University Press um, copy of the Quran that the interpretation they have, the translation. And actually, I don't have, I didn't write down 31 through 35 here, but another. Um, copy of the Quran. I have a different translation 
states that verse as, as follows. For the God revering, okay, in the one case it's uh, people who were aware of God, another is for the God revering, pious, there will surely be triumph, gardens and vineyards and youthful, full-breasted maidens of equal age. They will hear therein neither vain talk nor falsehood. And full-breasted maidens, maidens of matching age, um, has also been translated as uh, splendid companions. Uh, so there's, there's nothing, you know, but there's nothing in these verses about, um, th these are just for people who believe, who, who practice Allah's law. Um, and as far as the 72 virgins in the heaven, um, that apparently comes from one of the hadiths, or hadiths. You know, I'm not going to spell it, I almost did, but that won't help. But, um, and these are sayings ascribed to the Prophet Muhammad uh, later on after he, he related the word of God. And there's one that says, Truly the martyr is given by Allah Almighty six things. Forgiveness of sins from the first drop of his blood to be shed. Protection from the torment of the grave. Safety from the greatest fear, that is the day of judgment. Receiving the crown of veneration, a single sapphire of which is worth more than the whole world and its contents, marriage to 72 of the wide-eyed versions, and intercession on behalf of 70 of his relatives. And notice that 70 plays in there, like we talked before the show. 70 is a big number, or the number 7 anyway, is a very important number in Christianity also. And it, apparently it is here in, um, in Islam too. But what this one source of the hadith says, and shame on me, I didn't make note of uh, the source, but it says that the number 70 in Arabic denotes a great number. And it's also good to point out that um, they distinguish between just plain garden variety virgins or young women, full-breasted women or whatever, and the huris, H-O-U-R-I-E-S, plural, huris. And they are, they are uh, these maidens of matching age or um, these splendid companions that have gone to paradise and been re recreated for paradise so they're different altogether and they and the, what this one note here says that there are um they get 70 of these huris and two women from the world um but everybody apparently you know goes through a transition when they come into paradise or make the transition to paradise so but that, that's where that, there's that misinterpretation of that hadith. And as you said, there, there are, and I saw too, there, there are various reliabilities, you know, ascribed to them or whatever, or accuracies. So it's just like anything else that's thousands of years old. You know, we really don't know for sure. But nothing in the Quran talks about 72 virgins in heaven. It's just, you know, like I said, maidens of matching age or splendid companions. Okay. Hey. From, I get it from what you were saying there. It's talking about these are rewards for people who live the good life, the, the faithful life, and not to being killed in battle or anything like that. No, it has nothing to do with being killed in battle, although the Hadith does imply, you know, that um, the martyr will have forgiveness of his sins from the first drop of his blood to be shed. So, okay. you know, that could be anything, but, um, you know, not necessarily killing of innocents or whatnot. But, you know, I do notice that uh, there's nothing said about what the women get in heaven as far as, you know, maidens. But um, at least not in the verses I saw. I think elsewhere it does mention um, something for them, but, um, you know, specifically. But anyway. Um, well, there was one source I read referred to, like, the hori is gender neutral. It can be either gender. Now that, wow, no, I didn't catch that. Um and that would seem to uh, match the splendid companions um, thing. It's a gender-neutral translation yeah. of whatever. A gender-neutral, yeah. To. And I did read where they are transformed, where, um, and I guess it's implied, I guess this uh, analogous, you know, thinking or reasoning or whatever, but uh, the women who come to paradise do not um, purge themselves. I mean, they don't. I, I guess we, they consume food and, and drink, although not not intoxicating drink, um, but they don't eliminate it. There's there's no 
filth that way is, is kind of the way yeah, it is. Yeah, and there's also no nasal discharge. There's no right. saliva. There's no tears. They don't <laughs> have their monthly cycles or anything yeah, like that. So. And I, I presume that the same applies for the men as far as discharge of bodily fluids and whatnot. So they're, it's kind of like a pure existence. I mean, I'm implying, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, if it applies to women that way. They make that transformation. They must also to guys, I guess, or well, males. If we're talking about the Hori, I'm not sure that they ever were a human on Earth, from what I read. Good point, they yes. They refer to them as being like 60 cubits tall, which I believe is about 90 feet tall. So I don't know whether that means that the humans are much taller when they are in paradise or not, or whether there's a great discrepancy in the stature maybe it's the angle of the sun or whatever i don't know the refraction you know anyway yeah, i don't know where this what the source of this this was either okay. where okay that's right we're quoting from but right the hurries were created they are pure and in heaven or paradise yeah, and already. another description of them was that they're virtually translucent that you can see through their flesh and their bones to actually see the marrow in the bones Okay, so, so that's starting to rule out really, any kind of sexual thing. They're you know? really uh, another being yeah. than those that inhabit this planet. And all that tends to support the idea that it's not about sex, it's not about sensuality, it's about wonderful companions and just being in a paradise where, you know, you have all things good, you know. And really, since you spend the whole time on Earth... Um, controlling your human appetites, you know, the one for sex, you know, primarily, um, it seems to make sense that you, that wouldn't be a concern in, in paradise, that you just wouldn't be that interested. That appetite doesn't exist yeah, anymore. Yeah, that wouldn't exist, yeah. Like. So that, you know, that's all that's possible. I don't know, and uh, we're just speculating. Anyway, we, um... We were pausing for thoughts. <laughs> yes, well, I am pausing. Well, yes, and I want to remind the listeners, uh, we got about nine minutes left in the broadcast. This is the Pause for Thought with Wayne Parker Lang Baker talking about things people believe about Islam. And uh, you can call in 343-9927, 343-9927, if you'd like to join the discussion. Speaking of martyrs in the way that many Americans view it, as, as far as Islam goes anyway, uh, I looked up the killing of innocents and how that's uh, dealt with in the Quran, and I found a lot of uh, passages. Uh, the first one was uh, six one fifty one, that states, "Do not take life which God has made sacred, except by right." And there's one that says, um, "Fight in God's cause against those who fight you." Okay, and to me that implies, and of course the rest of this gives context to it, that implies that if somebody else isn't trying to thwart you in your living in God's, God's way, in accordance with God's will, leave them alone. You have no yeah. reason to fight them. So. Sounds kind of like a stand your ground law. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> fight in God's cause against those who fight you, but do not overstep the limits. God does not love those who overstep the limits. Kill them wherever you encounter them and drive them out from where they drove you out. For persecution is more serious than killing. Do not fight them at the sacred mosque unless they fight you there. If they do fight you, kill them. But if they stop, then God is most forgiving and merciful. Fight them until there is no more persecution. And that all tells, to me, tells me that you're authorized to kill basically in defending yourself or your musk or, you know, defending yourself from persecution and only fight until the persecution is stopped. That's how I see that anyway. That um, sounds reasonable. And let's see, there's, um, he says, We decreed to the children of Israel that if anyone kills a person, unless in retribution for murder or spreading corruption in the land, it is as if he kills all mankind. Our messengers came to them with clear signs, but many of them continued to commit excesses in the land. Those who wage war against God and his messenger and strive to spread corruption in the land should be punished by death, unless they repent before you overpower them. In that case, bear in mind that God is forgiving and merciful. Uh, we got a call coming in. Good evening. You're live on the air with a pause for thought. Can I know who's calling, please?
guess they were just kidding. Um, probably weren't planning on getting on the air. Anyhow, um, so anyway, um, let's see where I leave off on that. I, I did notice, though, in there that it says that if they stop fighting you, then God is most merciful and, you know, forgiving. And that's said in a number of the passages I've found here, for instance, with homosexuality. You know, if two men are found to be having relations or whatever, they should be punished. But if they repent to you, the human being, if they repent to the people, you know, they, you know to you, then you are obligated to be respectful and forgive them and leave them alone. So it's it's a very real, very healthy type of um, approach, I guess. That God, there, you know, Allah is merciful and forgiving, you know. But uh, anyway, so you know, as far as you know, none of this has anything to do with the um, ISIS or the people that are committing the the horrible crimes now in the name of their religion, um, and of course. Christians have done just as terrible things, too. We just, I guess, developed laws in Western civilization um, a lot sooner, and those types of extremes don't go on that often, at least not in the United States. Yeah, well, we see that among other religions around the world as well. And, and actually, there was one site I saw that said that um, all religion, religious violence is generally based upon ignorance of that you know specific religion whatever religion they're they're quoting and that's what i've seen too it, it's people who don't really know anything about their religion they seize on one aspect of it or one translation of the text and they run with that and they use that to justify everything they they say and do to other people you know i think i mean we're getting i'm getting a little off topic here but just generalizing the human condition i think we often tend to rationalize with whatever justification comes to mind for whatever we're already intent upon doing. Yes, and I, I often thought about that with the people that stand along the um, pride parade route, the pride parade route, uh, screaming their anger and everything else. It's like, so you're claiming that the Bible says to do this you, but you seem to feel your anger very deeply. I mean, is it because God ordered this, you know, as, a, as an abomination, or is there a more personal reason for this, you know? It, I forget who it was that happened to point out that people like that, it's interesting how um, God's will always seems to agree with their prejudices, you know? And I guess, I guess that's what you were getting off on there or talking about there. People can rationalize anything. Um, yeah, I think whether they're religious or not, there is a human tendency to rationalize with, with uh, whatever justifies the course of action a person's intent upon. Okay. And yeah. sometimes it's a retrospective thing. You do it, and then you come up with the reasons why. Yeah, and I yeah, and I'm not going to say I'm immune to that, or you know, I don't think any of us are. But we all have. We are all human. But you got to keep on top of that stuff, though. And that's what I count on friends for, really, to point out when I'm, you know, maybe kidding myself or. You know, I, that, that, to me, that's my the highest level of friendship is to tell me when I'm being really stupid or something. You know, don't take that as you know. Don't take it the wrong way. But anyhow, um, I looked into the status of women too, since they're assumed to be made subservient. Have you too? I've run across that. Yeah, uh, in fact, there's there are quite a few references to, for example, uh, the rights of inheritance. Uh, woman gets half the inheritance of the man. Yeah, they're uh, quite detailed about inheritances, yeah, but the women always get at, get the in shorter In areas in, in the unequal rights with respect to the father and the mother over the children, and uh, even when, when you're talking about a court case and the value of a witness's testimony, that a man's testimony is worth twice that of a woman, and I don't know, even more than that than a non-believer, and I think it's like 15 or 16 times that of whatever the lowest category in this hierarchy of the weight of witnesses' testimony. Yeah. And, you know, in in defense of that, I guess, what I've, what I've seen written, and I kind of agree with it, too, it's before Islam, before the Prophet Muhammad shared God's, you know, word or God's law, Women had no inheritance. They had no rights at all. They could be raped, murdered, you know, taken as a slave, anything. Um, but Islam established the limits and 
establish some justice in the land. It may not have been perfectly equal, but then again, as I read one um, theologian point out, men and women have different roles. You know, there isn't perfect equality in the sense that they're both the same. We are equal in God's eyes, which they do say in the Quran, um, but the, the societal roles are different. And there may have been a practical reason for men getting more inheritance. I, I'm not, I can't speak to that. But, you know, what, he, what, what, ha, what it has in the Quran about that is uh, certainly an improvement. But, hey, we got to go. Um, I just talked myself all the way through the show. But uh, anyhow, you've been listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on A Pause for Thought. We thank you for listening. And we got to go. You have a good night. <laughs>